Uh, hi everyone, uh, I'm Prashant and uh, I've been working on a project that integrates OpenStack Swift with LuxRFS. Uh, so, OpenStack Swift is uh, is a suite of tools uh, that is used in cloud deployments and Swift is uh, one of the components of OpenStack. So, let's get into what OpenStack Swift is and uh, what it can offer to object store users. So, when I say an object, uh, what, compri what comprises, uh, what, what is called as an object. So, object has data uh, which could be um, uh, let us say text file or binary data or anything. Uh, it could have uh, metadata associated with it. For example, the owner of that object or uh, the mind type, let us say uh, audio, video or the content length. So, that is what is called as metadata and identifier uh, is, is the name of the object. So, that is how you access and store objects in the Swift cluster. So, um, how many of you have heard of Amazon S3 or used it? Okay. Um, for those of you who did not know this, Amazon S3 is used by Dropbox, uh, Pinterest, uh, Tumblr, and a lot many other uh, services. So even even though you have not used it directly, you might have indirectly used Amazon S3. And uh, it's an alternative to Amazon S3. And OpenStack Swift is used by uh, Wikipedia. So if you go to Wikipedia and see some images, those images, uh, the thumbnails of those images are uh, stored in uh, OpenStack Swift. And also uh, there are companies such as uh, Rackspace and SwiftStack that. Uh, provide services similar to Amazon S3 based on OpenStack Swift. So, Swift is uh, already in production. And uh, unlike other uh, OpenStack components such as Nova, Cinder, Glance, and uh, other stuff, OpenStack Swift is fairly independent from the rest of the components. Uh, in other words, you can deploy OpenStack Swift as a standalone product without having nothing to do, well, nothing to do with other uh, OpenStack components. And it's suited to store uh, unstructured data, for example, um, uh, images, video files, or um, or even books or something like that. And it scales horizontally, which means if you need more storage, just add more, add more nodes or or add more uh, devices. So, but but Swift um, is is for a very specific use case, which is of object store. So you cannot have uh, file system hierarchies in Swift. Uh, in other words, you cannot mount it and edit objects as files. So that is a plain script. There is a workaround for that. And uh, what you need to remember uh, about Swift is it has this uh, predefined hierarchy. So a cluster can have many accounts, and each account can have many containers, and containers have objects. So in Amazon S3 terms, these uh, containers are are buckets in Amazon S3 term now. So let's see what what uh, Swift has to uh, offer. So it's, it's truly distributed in nature. Um, there is no central server, master, slaves, or anything. So all all nodes are uh, treated equally, and it can uh, scale to petabytes. And uh, there are uh, deployments. Uh, for example, there is a cancer research uh, institute that has a deployment about six petabytes, and uh, it's highly available. And it, it has a very modular structure such as ClusterFS uh, uh, translator interface like Lala mentioned. So if you want to add a feature to Swift, uh, you just add a middleware. It's also called as filter. You can extend Swift by doing that. So this S3 API support uh, is implemented in that way. So if you have existing applications that access Amazon S3, they can be ported uh, to access Swift with, with very minimal or absolutely no code changes. And also you can set account quotas based on uh, number of objects and also uh, the size in bytes. So you can say that this account is allowed to store 1 million objects or, or objects that, that sum up to 1 terabyte. And also you have uh, authentication filters. So having a modular structure allows you to have different kinds of filters. So based on your use case, you can have filters that store 
uh, username, password, and account information in plain text files. You have filters that store it in databases. Also, you have filters that allow you to have uh, Active Directory or LDAP integration so that in an organization, if you have existing users, they can access Swift using uh, their existing accounts and credentials. And also, uh, there is a feature called as Container to Container Sync. So you can, um, let's say you have um, one data center here in Bangalore and another in a different location. You can keep uh, containers or uh, sync cloud for, you know what sync means. And uh, there is object versioning. So if you uh, upload more versions of an object, it will fetch the latest version, but there are APIs available to fetch the previous versions also. Also, you can set an expiry date on, on an object. So you can say that uh, when you uh, upload an object, you can say that delete this object after uh, one hour or one week or something like that. And also, uh, you have support for global uh, clusters. So this is analogous to uh, the geo replication feature in Cluster So you can replicate uh, stuff across data centers. So they have a provision. Uh, to use a separate replication network for uh, replication. And also you, you get to use uh, region affinity. Uh, what, what that means is, uh, let's say you have a global cluster, one in uh, Bangalore, another in uh, Paris. So clients that are closer to uh, Bangalore, uh, their writes or reads would be served from uh, the closest uh, location. And also the last feature which is uh, the most recent and the most important one is is uh, storage policies. What that allows you to do is um, it gives flexibility in terms of where your data gets stored. For, for example, um, uh, until now, uh, before this uh, feature was implemented, all your data would be stored with, with a rigid uh, replica account. For example, for an entire cluster, the replica account would be three, then all the objects would be replicated thrice. But with storage policies, you can set one storage policy per container. You can say that all the objects that go into this container would have uh, would be stored uh, in three copies, and uh, let's say all the objects that go to another container uh, would be stored in two or one copy. So uh, maybe one use case that I can think of is is your uh, thumbnail images. So if you have uh, let's say Facebook uses open site script and it uses thumbnails for profile pictures. So you can store thumbnails in containers with replica 1 and actual images in containers with replica 3. So if you lose that thumbnails, they can be uh, regenerated. So that is that is the kind of flexibility that storage policies uh, allow you to. Uh, and also uh, you can store objects based on different um, backends. Uh, for example, you can uh, store objects in regular XFS or the client can choose to store objects in cluster FS. So the power is given to Client with uh, this storage policy feature. Any questions so far? Is there any level of caching? Yes. So um, there is no caching for objects as such. That is not provided by Swift, but that caching has to be provided by uh, the storage, uh, the storage layer. But metadata caching is provided uh, in build. So this is how uh, clients would access a Swift cluster. So uh, you have storage nodes which are um, which are not accessible to the outside world. So they are behind a LAN, and you have proxy nodes which are publicly available. So clients can talk to proxy nodes. So proxy nodes, if you see it in one sense, it can be single point of failures. So if a proxy node goes down. Uh, there is no way for the client to access the data that resides in the storage cluster. So usually in production deployments, there are multiple uh, uh, instances of proxy nodes um, for uh, load balancing and also for uh, redundancy. So um, Swift mainly has uh, four components, uh, that is account server, container server, object server and proxy server. So proxy server is the one that talks to clients and replies back to clients. And account server uh, maintains a database which contains information about accounts. Container server maintains a database which contains information about containers. 
an object server stores object as files on a plain XFS partition. So storage nodes usually have object container uh, and account server running and proxy nodes have proxy server running. So this is another way to look, that, look at it. So when a client uh, requests proxy server to either fetch an object or store an object, the proxy server would look into uh, this static data structure uh, called as ring, I will come back to it later. And the ring would fetch um, information appropriately from account, object or container server. For example, um, if, if the client wants to know what objects uh, reside within a container, it does a get on the container and the container server would read the container database and return the listing back to proxy server which, which would return to a uh, client. And, and about the modular structure that, that I uh, discussed earlier, so each, each of these servers uh, would have a pipeline of uh, WSGI middlewares. So the request would uh, go from client to the server in this order. So this, this is what uh, provides modularity. For example, this tempod uh, module, uh, it provides authentication. Account quotas module, it provides uh, uh, quotas based on accounts. So let's say uh, you get a use case where you want to turn your entire cluster to uh, read only, uh, maybe during an upgrade process. So you could write your own middleware, let's say in less than 100 lines of code and put it somewhere here. And you can turn your entire cluster as, as read-only. So that is the kind of flexibility that uh, the modular structure uh, provides. Any questions? So let's look into um, how the Swift API looks like. So all all communication with Swift by clients are, are over HTTP, rest based so um, you need to remember that that uh, URL uh, that structure there account slash container slash object. So for example, if you want to fetch an object from script, so this is how your request would uh, look like. So a get is a fetch. Similarly, you know other HTTP works can post daily. So uh, if you have authentication mechanism turned on, so initially the client gives a username and password, you would get a token. And all subsequent requests to either fetch objects or put objects would have that token. So that token would, would be a header. So, so this, this would be proxy server. If I have one instance, if I have multiple instances behind a load balancer, that would be the IP for load balancer. And this is the account. V1 is the API number, container, and, and that entire thing and thing is an object. So uh, one thing to remember that the, that the slashes after the container that A, B, C, B, Z, that whole thing is one single entity and the slashes do not mean actually, do not mean anything. So, any questions? Now let's uh, move on to a really important data structure in Swift that decides how uh, data is placed and how many copies of data is placed. So it, it's called uh, the ring. So the ring is a, is a complex data structure which um, which decides uh, how many copies of data and where the data would go to. So just like ClusterFS, Ring uses md sum for hashing. So the entire md sum hash space is divided into partitions. So these are logical partitions and these have nothing to do with the partitions on, on the disk. And each uh, and some number of partitions are assigned to a particular device which is a disk. So when the URL which is account slash container slash object is hashed <coughs> by md sum, the first few bits of the hash is taken and that is found on this ring structure. So it would, it would point you to a partition and you have a table which maps partition to devices. So based on that mapping you get to store, you get to know that where this object would go to. So these ring uh, data structures are are managed externally, and and a very are, and a very important part of Swift. So external tools are used to create these ring data structures, and these ring files are pushed onto every node. So the intelligence of data placement uh, resides in in these uh, ring files. 
So in, in cluster FS, uh, the hashing is, is very rigid. So um, so when, when a new device is added in cluster FS, uh, compared to Swift, more amount of data is, is moved. Because we uh, divide um, the hash space here into partitions and and assign a certain number of partitions to uh, test. So the amount of data that is moved during a rebalance operation is, is less compared to uh, glass surface. So um, we need to have these ring files on each each of the Swift nodes, and the Swift nodes would would read these ring files to locate the actual physical location of the object. So whenever you add a disk or a, or a node to the Swift cluster, you need to regenerate these files and push these files to every uh, node. So there are management demons uh, that allow you to do this. So uh, yeah, and and when you generate these ring files, what are the tunables that you uh, get to uh, change? So when you add devices, uh, you, you get this option called as device weight. So let's say you have a two terabyte hard drive and and a ten terabyte hard drive. Such thing exists. So you can assign a greater weight to the ten terabyte hard drive. So what that will do is it will assign more number of logical partitions to that device. So what that means is in the ring data structure, more partitions are assigned to the bigger device. So it's more likely that more objects would go to the bigger device. And also uh, you can place devices and nodes into logical zones. And Swift has this algorithm that would place objects as uniquely as possible. Let's say you have uh, uh, five hard drives and three zones, and you assign each hard drive to a zone, and one one would have two drives. So, and you set the replica count as three, and Swift would place those um, uh, objects uh, in three different zones. So, how you decide which drive would go to which zone is is totally up to you based on how likely or on what basis your cluster would likely go down. For example, um, uh, let's say you have a data center with three buildings. So the tendency is to divide uh, mark one uh, zone as a building. Or if you have one data center, you can have one rack as a zone based on uh, how likely your network would go down or the power would go down. And uh, this is how the MD FISOM uh, is carried out. So you have this path account slash container slash object. So that is hashed. You have a per cluster prefix and suffix uh, that is added to uh, prevent MD FISOM collision attacks. That is to prevent client from guessing uh, what the hash would be. So that is to uh, remain secret. You can uh, configure that. So. Um, that MD FISOM index is uh, is mapped onto uh, the ring data structure, and uh, this table uh, maps on uh, to uh, the partition number. So let's say uh, a get on an object is is uh, sent by the client. So the server, the proxy server, would look into uh, the ring data structure, and from this table, it would get uh, where these copies uh, reside actually. And based on uh, the number of uh, the partition number, you know which node and which device the actual file resides on. Any other questions? So this is a uh, this is a script that um, that generates the initial uh, ring files. So each uh, object server would have its own ring files. Container server would have its own ring files, and uh, account server uh, would have its own ring files. So you can see that uh, R1 R1 is region one, Z1 is zone one, and that is the IP of the node and on the port on which one instance of object server is running. 
and the 10 there um, is the number of partitions, the 3 is the replica count, and the 1 is, is the, I don't know what that is, and the 1 here uh, is the drive weight. So let's say the SDB4, SDB4 there is a larger drive compared to the other 3 drives. You can assign a, assign a larger weight so that more partitions are assigned to that uh, device. And uh, yeah, so here the partition number is 3, but there are 4 devices. So the shift can choose uh, any one among the 4 devices. And um, so let's say um, uh, when a write is uh, coming from a client and, and one of the uh, devices go down, so it would choose the other device as a handoff node to complete that write until the other device comes up. So this is how uh, ring files are generated. Once these commands are done, you will get those uh, files and you need to push that to each node. And here this part is, is where you get to define uh, storage policies. For example, this, this is the second ring file for object server and this is a different instance running in a different mode. So this, this version of the object server uh, has a code that can talk to a cluster request. So uh, this is how you generate uh, ring files. Any questions here? Yeah. Yes. Sorry? So the earlier talk and SFS was using the file system. And this one is talking to file system. Yeah. So, so by default, OpenStack Swift talks to XFS. So with storage policy feature and some uh, code, so OpenStack Swift has this uh, uh, pluggable uh, disk file class. There's this class called disk file. So if you have your own storage system, such as clusterfs or or cephs, uh, so you can override that class to provide your own implementation. So for example, uh, let's say there is a write API. So you can override write API to provide your own implementation, let's say you have your own file system. So Swift allows you to plug any uh, disk file API implementation as, as a storage policy there. So here, I'll, I'll give a demo later, here the number is 1, so this is a different uh, ring file. So the 1 would have a friendly name, so when a client creates a container, he can say that use this storage policy. And all, all the objects put into that storage policy would would use that this ring files to decide where uh, the data would go. So this is a, a very recent feature. Uh, it's not merged into master yet. It will be merged probably this week. Any other questions? So here, uh, let me show you. In one of the other talks, the OpenStack summit, there was a comparison of of a. Uh, Ceph, uh, Swift and uh, Cluster, uh, this data could be somewhat outdated because the lines of code has reached some 9000. If you see, Swift is a relatively younger uh, project and uh, it's based on uh, Python, so these are some uh, statistics. But but one thing that, that you need to keep in mind is Swift is, is a, has a very specific use case of object storage. It does not provide a file system interface on its own.
So I have a Swift cluster set up, um, which is a four node cluster, and I have um, four instances of account server running, uh, four instances of container server, uh, one proxy server, and this fifth instance of object server is is the one which talks to our cluster address. So let's create a, a account. So as I said, account is a is a database. First, step. so I have proxy server running on port eighty eighty. Creating a account here. So if you can see here, there are three uh, databases created. These are SQLite databases, and and all those uh, three databases reside on different nodes. Here I I have emulated uh, different nodes in a single machine. So you can see one, two, and four. There are four nodes. You can see one, two, and four. So Swift has placed uh, those. Uh, accounts into uh, different zones. So this is how uh, Swift places data. So I'll, I'll create a container within that. If you remember the syntax there, it's account slash container slash object. So I created a container now. So now you have uh, three copies of uh, container uh, data this way. And I'll create an object called over. And put some data into it. see three copies of, of the object. So these are placed on uh, normal XFS partitions on, on different nodes. So if you can if you open these files over a file system interface you would see uh, this data hello. But um, for you, you won't get a human uh, friendly uh, notation of, of this path. Sorry? Yes, the content, uh, for example, here the hello, that would be stored in these files. So it, it may not be just data, you can just upload a file. Sorry? This is actually a file system. Yes. 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 Sorry? Based on uh, the number of uh, drives and nodes that you have. So the the point here is is uh, no one accesses these files over file system interface. So on, everyone accesses accesses it over uh, Swift only. Yeah. The operation of the scheme and the area. Yes. Yes. So the caching is given is based on the file system caching. Yes. There is metadata caching, uh, for example, uh, uh, a container listing that would list objects. Those are cached, but the files as such are not cached. So this is the like code line counts. Code line counts and. That, that, that is not performance. So, 
like i said swift swift can only talk over rest and and self uh, self has a, a rest interface uh, that is that supports swift api but their layer uh, their layer is is uh, integrated with with the their object store so their object store is is not analogous to uh, swift's object store but but we have not done any uh, performance comparison with self yet yeah those uh, databases are uh, sql like data set sorry so uh, you have account servers and container servers the account servers contain a list of uh, containers in them so those are stored in those databases okay just the sql metadata only yes yes only metadata are stored in databases and and the metadata of actual objects those are uh, stored in uh, exactos on file system so the metadata of the actual object for example so the actual object here the actual object here that file that would have some uh, metadata which is which is stored in the exactos extended attributes of the file the size of the file things like yeah the content length and and uh, which container it belongs to so now let's see how um, how it integrates with the cluster of us an additional storage policy here called as a cluster fs with the policy number 1 you remember that one from the uh, ring files earlier so this is a, a different policy and i have a cluster fs a volume mounted over here at uh, at this path now i create a container uh, called c2 so this is all uh, the client is doing all this and provide a header that would say use this uh, storage policy so another container is created i put an object to uh, that container so remember that c2 container is marked with cluster of storage policy and you can see this this uh, hierarchy created here so this is the naming convention that that cluster of fs object server implementation would use so the account would be a directory or the container would be a directory within it and oven uh, would be uh, the file so the advantage here is is uh, apart from the swift's api inter uh, rest interface you get to access those objects as raw files over uh, raw files over fugus or uh, file system so another thing that storage policies offer is is let's say you have a third policy which says ssd and and you can build a simple middleware maybe under 50 lines of code that that would place objects on ssd based on the content length so that is the kind of flexibility that storage policies allow you so from from a Uh, product perspective you can have different policies let, let's say na named as a uh, gold silver or bronze and and uh, let's say uh, gold would provide four copies two on uh, um, two on ssd something like that and bronze would would provide two copies one stored on on uh, erasure coded device so that is how you, how you can leverage uh, storage policies 
any other questions? I'll just show you the, the pipeline once here. This is a bar file of a proxy server. We have uh, the pipeline here, so I can add, I can add, uh, let's say, an authentication module somewhere in between, and that would take care of authentication. You can write your own custom middleware there that would turn the entire cluster into read-only, or, or maybe certain accounts into read-only. So each each of these filters uh, can have configuration option. For example, here the temp auth filter you can add users and add uh, users here and define roles. This is an admin or normal user or things like that. So Swift has a very pluggable architecture to the next step. Any other questions? Okay, so we can solution like this. Okay, so we Of their how they have used Swift, but but externally if they use Swift, each file is a each image on Wikipedia is a file. So, so for for example, uh, Facebook has has this object storage called as Facebook. Yeah. It's not open source yet. So what what they do is they have a huge XFS partitions partition of hundred terabyte, and they have one single file of of uh, hundred GB, and and all the uh, images that that store on Facebook that would go to uh, a stack. So that one uh, 100, 100 GB file is, is a append only storage. So as, as the image comes in, they append it. So they have their own implementation based on their use case because they couldn't scale, they did this. And also each file would have uh, its own metadata, metadata such as UID, GID and that was of no relevance to them. So they had their own block store. So it depends on the use case. Hello. So as I update user, I have to put it to store complaints, right? Now if you can ask me to put something over it and say see the images. What Swift is, is built for is, is the client just does a put and a get. Yes. And the client doesn't care where it is stored, how is it stored. Exactly. So from you want to be be simpler enough for clients to No, the API is simple enough, right? So the, this is this is all what the API is. So you just you just put images or upload images here, and this logical separation account slash container is, is purely logical. It, there is no one on one mapping unless you use uh, cluster FS. There is no one on one mapping from uh, this path uh, to the actual file path. So, as a user of Amazon S3 or Swift, you don't really care where it, it is stored on disk or how it is stored. You just get this API, that's all. Like, it's not but are there many kind of to store? People say, go to use, find this and store one image per one image per It is not as such to take. 
is what this is needed. I will I will not I don't know whether that is the so here the object server, uh, it has no database, the object server has no database where it has to look up the location of the actual object. So this, this weird path here that is derived from the hash of, of the object name, account slash container slash object. So it, it just has to get that hash, compute this path. It has no lookup or no read there or anything. Just compute this path and fetch. So it's just one operation. So what is lost is, is the small amount of additional metadata, uh, for example UID, GID or something like that. But except for that it's very efficient because it, it's just one operation to fetch. Not not on on the there is no there is no flaw as such in in the hashing. But but uh, clusterfs also uses hashing. But but things there uh, need additional care uh, on on file renames. So in, in clusterfs, when you rename a file, so the hash would change. So so there you you would want to link to the actual hash list there. But here the the rename operation is not allowed. So there is no renaming. So that, that would happen, that would happen in one scenario where this is like purely imaginative, where all your ring files in all nodes get corrupted. So if, if at least one, one ring file would get corrupt on one node, you would have the ring file copies in other node. So as, as soon as you copy the other uh, the proper ring files to this node, it would correct itself. So the ring file has all the intelligence to place uh, data and, and how you build ring files that freedom is given to you. Any other questions? Thank you.